Okay, so we have seen the traditional view of the business environment. Let's look now at the ecosystem view of business environments. This is a very interesting and relatively recent uh, idea emerging in the context of theories of the business environment. So the plan for the upcoming videos is as follows. We're going to start with a look at what exactly an ecosystem is. We'll give you some basic definitions and some examples as well. From there, then we're going to move into ecosystems in the business context, the modern business context. In section three, we're going to look at two key concepts in the context of the ecosystem theory, and those are mutuality and orchestration. In section four, we're going to look specifically at digital business platforms and how important they have become in the context of ecosystems. In section five, we're going to look at the crucial uh, question of how value is created in ecosystems. And then in section six, we're going to finish by summarizing the main differences between the ecosystem view and that traditional view that we studied in a previous video. And so we start with a basic question. What exactly is an ecosystem? Well, we're going to look here at a basic definition of what an ecosystem is, but don't worry if you don't immediately grasp exactly what we're talking about. That will become clear as we go through these videos by applying the concept and looking at how it functions in the real world with various examples. But it is a good place to start with a basic definition, and here it is. An ecosystem can be defined as a complex web of interdependent enterprises and relationships aimed at creating and allocating business value. Ecosystems tend to be broad, potentially spanning multiple geographies and industries, including public and private institutions and consumers. Okay, a lot of words there, a lot of concepts, and a lot to take in. So let's start with some more general characteristics to clarify some of these ideas and concepts. Ecosystems are, when compared to the traditional view of business environments, they're more collaborative than the traditional view. If you recall, we talked about how adversarial organizations and companies are within a traditional market or traditional industry. Less adversarial, therefore, there's less conflict. Companies tend not to see each other in those terms as zero-sum adversaries in the competition for market share and profit. It requires organizations to view themselves as participants rather than simply static rivals who are always going to be in a combative relationship with their competitors. They also have to conceive of themselves in an ecosystem as adapting and evolving, much like the natural world ecosystems. That's where the term comes from, after all. It comes from the biological context of natural ecosystems. And exactly the same is the case in the business environment. You need to adapt and evolve to what has become, especially in recent decades, a highly fluid environment. Business environments are changing so rapidly now with the advent of digital technologies and the internet. Okay, so let's look at an example to clarify this further. We have the smartphone ecosystem. So in a traditional market, you would think of buyers and sellers, and you would have the industrial chain of supply and distribution, logistics and marketing that serves that final end customer. It's a very linear kind of relationship. However, in the case of ecosystems, we're dealing more with networks, very complex networks, lots of interdependencies and non-linear relationships. So, for example, if you think about the smartphone industry, you have, of course, as we saw before, you have companies like uh, Samsung and Apple. And of course, in this industry, they have a huge network of suppliers and distributors and logistics and sellers and so on and so forth. And then, of course, as well, you have the end user, the end consumer. But in the case of smartphones, you have a huge related ecosystem of things like applications. So you have companies with applications, and those applications need to be compatible with those smartphones, or rather, I should say, those smartphone producers need to ensure that their phones are compatible with various applications. And of course, then as well, you need to be able to access those applications via a store application on your smartphone, and so you have to take that into account as well. 
You have things like interconnectivity with other smart devices. You have, for example, the ability now to project from your smartphone screen to a larger screen in the same room via Wi-Fi connectivity. And of course, if those two devices are compatible, that's going to enhance the usability and the value of that smartphone for the user. It's especially valuable if you can do that with non-branded or other brand uh, devices. So, for example, you don't necessarily, as a smartphone manufacturer, want to limit that ability to other devices from your own company. You don't want it to be the case, for example, that only Samsung televisions will be able to connect with Samsung smartphones. You might want, actually, it to be an open ended thing where your device can connect with many different brands of screens and other devices. And so you have to think about collaborating with or indeed being open to your phone being compatible with many rival organizations and um, devices. And then you have things like 5G, these networks and infrastructures within which the smartphone operates. You have to ensure that your devices are up to date, that they're compatible with these emerging technologies, and that they're compatible with the infrastructures that are being put in place, for example, by organizations like governments and other stakeholders as well. So you can see just in this very simple case, a very, very common and a very, very visible uh, industry like the smartphone industry, there's a huge amount that's going on. It's so complex. There's a huge web and network of relationships and potential collaborations and things that need to be taken into account and potentially collaborating with rivals and rival companies and organizations to ensure that the end customer's value is increased, but that all people indeed within the industry, all stakeholders, that their experience is enhanced and is not uh, prohibited or restrained in any unnecessary way. So that's a good early understanding or early indication of what an ecosystem would look like. Okay, let's take a closer look now at some of the key characteristics and structural components of ecosystems in the business context. We'll start by looking at ecosystem participants. What kinds of groups and individuals are actually involved in an ecosystem in contradistinction or in contrast to the traditional view of uh, industries and markets. Well, first of all, we have producers. These constitute the supply side of the ecosystem by creating and providing goods and services, which are exchanged with other ecosystem participants. Note here, not necessarily customers. Rival producers are competitors to a producer's own offering. Of course, it was the case in the traditional view as well. But the most important point to bear in mind here is that producers are not necessarily always going to be looking or geared towards selling to customers. We're going to see that the modern business ecosystem is a little bit more complex and nuanced than that. Then you have regulators and government bodies and other agencies, for example, government regulators, trade unions, certification agencies, which might not necessarily actually be government agencies, but might be independent private agencies, policymakers and consumer associations. These stakeholder groups set the governing rules, standards and frameworks of the overall ecosystem. So. These are not necessarily just regulators, but these are groups that define the standards and the kinds of guidelines, recommendations, and the structure and the way that people behave within, the values within a particular ecosystem. So they set the overall framework and culture of the ecosystem. The next group then is what is called orchestrators. The groups driving the coordination, configuration, and management of stakeholder interactions and the structure of an ecosystem environment. The important role that the orchestrator plays in ecosystem environments will be explained in a little bit more detail later on. Then we have infrastructure suppliers, suppliers of the technical infrastructure needed to support and maintain in particular digital platforms, which we'll discuss a little bit later on as well, which allow ecosystems to flourish. Suppliers provide communication and IT systems and systems development expertise as well. Really, the modern ecosystem has coincided with the advent and emergence of 
of information technologies, particularly the internet, wireless technologies, cloud technologies, and so on. And that is really, really important for supplying the infrastructure for these very dynamic kinds of environments, much less linear than the previous traditional market view. And then finally, of course, you still have those consumers within the industry. They represent the demand side, of course, of this ecosystem environment, purchasing the goods and services produced by suppliers to the ecosystem. So it's important really to bear in mind that we're not dealing with the traditional linear set of relationships here. There's a much more dynamic interplay of forces going on in the ecosystem in contrast to the traditional market view. So you can see here the relationships, for example, often work both ways. You will have producers and government bodies and regulators interacting often in dynamic ways, not just the government bodies and regulate, regulators and certification agencies and so on actually dictating terms to the producers, but producers working in the other direction as well. You might have infrastructure suppliers working with governments, governments with infrastructure suppliers, orchestrators with consumers, consumers with producers, producers with other producers, and so on and so forth. So you have to bear that in mind with this ecosystem idea. We're dealing with a very a complicated and collaborative interactive network amongst all of the various participants. So think about it in a network sense rather than in a linear sense. The traditional structure and the traditional view of the market was much more linear. We were going from the suppliers, distributors, to the producers, to the sellers, to the customer. But here we're dealing with a much more complex web, lots of feedbacks, two-way feedbacks between the various participants within an ecosystem. Let's look at another example or illustration now, just to give you a sense of some of those participants in a real world example of an ecosystem. We're looking here at the transport or mobility ecosystem and especially the advent or the coming advent of self-driving vehicles. So for example, you will have of course the manufacturers of the self-driving vehicles. You have companies like Google who are getting involved in this and then you have other related companies like Uber, for example, they might not necessarily be directly involved, but they're certainly very interested. They have been involved, for example, in sponsoring some of these initiatives. And of course, from their point of view, this is a very interesting development because, of course, it might completely revolutionize the taxi cab industry and the ride sharing industry. If you can get a self-driving car, it will be a much different kind of industry for Uber then as well when it comes to what they do, bringing drivers and travelers together. Of course, if there's no driver involved, then that's going to have a huge influence on the cost structure of that particular company. You've also got then urban planners and government agents working on urban planning. This could be potentially revolutionary from their point of view, having just self-driving cars going around in city locations instead of people in cars looking for parking spaces and things like that. If you have self-driving cars, it totally changes everything. You could have, for example, the car bring you into your workplace in an urban location and the car then drives itself back to your home and then comes and picks you up when you're ready to go home from work. So things like parking lots and parking spaces may no longer be as necessary in this kind of ecosystem. So you're going to have potential for collaboration, communication, idea sharing amongst these three different participants. And then, of course, you have car insurance companies. The whole insurance industry stands to be potentially revolutionized as well by this particular technology. And so you're going to have a huge degree potentially of collaboration and idea sharing again amongst things like government bodies, urban planners and companies that are actually developing these self-driving vehicles like Google, for instance. And so you have this huge complex network within this ecosystem. This is not simply a linear thing of going from buyer to seller or going from producer, manufacturer to distributor to customer. We're looking at a whole web of independent 
uh, subsystems within this ecosystem. Uber is its own whole little world, and yet it is overlapping potentially with self-driving vehicles, with urban planners, with car insurance companies, and so on and so forth. So who exactly is who in this context, in this ecosystem, based on on those previous categories and participants that we've just been looking at. I'll give you a moment to think about it. Where do these various parties or participants fit? The self-driving uh, car manufacturers, Uber, for example, this urban planners and the government urban planners in the bottom left segment, and those car insurance companies as well. What kinds of participants are they? I'll give you a moment to think about that. You can go back to the previous slides and have a look at those different participants and then decide for yourself where these various examples fit in to that scheme. Okay, so if you said that the self-driving car manufacturers are producers, then of course you were right. That was probably one of the easier ones. What about Uber then? Well, Uber is one of those infrastructure suppliers. They're supplying a digital network and platform and interface where potentially those self-driving cars can be connected up with people looking to get to various locations. What about urban planners? Well, they fall into that category of regulators governing bodies because they set the framework. They're going to be setting some really, really important ground rules and so on and so forth for these self-driving cars, where they can go, where they can't go, what they can do on the roads and so on and so forth. And then finally, you have the car insurance and they are also going to fall into that category of regulators, government bodies, and so on, because they are, after all, setting some of those key frameworks, standards, and guidelines. They're going to say that certain things can't be done, certain things will and won't be covered by insurance, and so on and so forth. So there's just a one example of an ecosystem and the kinds of participants that are involved.